Today, in this session, we're going to be talking about the top five things wrong with policy frameworks for innovation and entrepreneurship and how to fix them. It's a problem that bridges across the entire planet and looking forward to hearing about how these individuals that work in, uh, on amazing projects have encountered difficulties with, with innovation policy frameworks and um, how we can move forward and better address these sort of issues. So without further ado, here's Georgia. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. So in this sunny day, we're going to talk about something we really love, politics, and how to speak bad things about governments, which I'm really excited because I used to be a government girl, so I'm not anymore. So since then, I really like to talk bad things about government, like make some group therapy. No, I'm kidding. We're actually going to be really proposing like things that like work or things that don't work. Um, we are part of GEEK, Global Innovation Gathering. I'm sure you were, who were before the last talk with also some GEEK fellows. So I'm going to call my three fellows that are going to be part of the session with me, but we're also going to leave a spare chair. So if, if you feel like joining like for specific topics, please come so we can discuss together. So please come, Jay, Martin, and Angela. Welcome. And then I, you can just present yourself, maybe. So, um, <coughs> hi guys. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Now you could make it. Yeah. <laughs> are you good? Yeah. Most people. So, um, we we made a survey inside the network uh, asking about good and bad practices. Uh, in the interactions between grassroots innovators, makerspaces, innovation hubs, and governments. And there was some really nice insights. We're not going to share the survey with you, but we're going to, we took five uh, main points uh, that almost appear in all of the answers, and uh, we're going to share some thoughts about five specific topics. So the first one is um, tax. Tax ram. So, um, I don't know, maybe Nanjira wants to start? About, I mean, a lot of Kenyan people are really answered about 17% uh, of much. hardware uh, import taxes for importation. So, yes. yeah. Um, so, good morning, everyone. And I'm sorry if Can I sound like... Can you present like yourself as well? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm Nanjira Sambuli from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and I've been working with the Innovation Hub or the iHub there. Um, as far as tax goes, it it's almost like one of those things that just hurts in innovators and entrepreneurs across the board. So from the fact that at the end of it, the little salary you get is gonna be charged 30%, even before that, you have issues of how much it actually costs to import, uh, especially for those working in manufacturing. However, I must say that um, last year we had an impromptu visit by our president to our hub. He literally showed up and um, he, he saw what was happening and he was talked through, especially around the hardware aspect. And one of the big challenges, obviously, when he asked the question, was everybody told him, look, it's impossible to import. The import duty for manufacturing is impossible. We don't know if that worked, but hey, when the next budget was read, there was a subsidy. So for people who are working in manufacturing in Kenya right now, to import the parts, is the fee is subsidized. Um, but it took that. Uh, so there are those linkages that we don't know, and we'll get to that later, but that was just one of those situations where I think, having seen the evidence from the policy perspective, I think he went and bashed some, some people's heads and that happened. We give thanks. Uh, but the tax, that was one big huddle. Obviously, there's on the other hand, when you actually, if ever, earn income as a company, when you start getting taxed, and I'm sure Jay and uh, Martin will also have perspectives on that, so. Yeah, well, um, the funny thing about my country, the Philippines, is that we've got one of the highest tax tables in Southeast Asia and even Asia. Um, that fundamentally is, is a big challenge. Um, however, I've seen a lot of you know, um, government um, incentives that are being put in place. Um, I'm sure that happens as well in different countries, but my opinion is it seems like an oppressive tax structure hmm. that, that, uh, that's a challenge for innovators. Um, they try to put band-aid solutions one after the other. Right. Okay, one for ICT incentives, one for entrepreneurial incentives, one for 
what may be a startup incentive in the future. The problem there is you end up with a monolithic complex structure that's very unwieldy and very costly for the government to maintain and very costly for the government to educate the people about. Um, so it, it, it's, it's sort of like um, you know, good intentions, but again, the execution sort of like blows up. Um, there is one specific case where um, we have little districts in, in the Philippines called barangays, that's sub-municipal level. So it, it, you know, the, the intention, again, is very good. It, it's closer to the people, it's more grassroots. Um, and there are in incentives at that level. The problem is nobody knows about them. Um, and if I knew about them as an entrepreneur, I go to the barangay office, they don't know anything about it. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's the type of thing that, that results out of a very, you know, over complex, over engineered um, um, solution. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have a good project that they would like to share about tax exemptions that actually helped? No, I'm kidding. You want to say? It's because it's a nice case. Uh, thank you. I come from Recife, that is in northeast of Brazil, and Recife was constructed by the Dutch, so it's a bunch of islands, and it used to be a swamp. And one of these islands during the 90s was quite destroyed. The one in the city center involved with the drug dealing, these things. And what the, the state government made was a tax reduce for that part of the city. So it, every company, uh, every technological company that went in to, to have that building into that part of the city had 2% uh, to pay on tax, what usually pay in Brazil 27 to 31%. And when you have a technological company inside the main island, you pay just 2%, what's quite good. And now there's a lot of innovation and practices and no more drug dealing and these things. Okay. Quite fast, isn't it? Yeah. Can we go to the next one or do you want to... Let's expand a bit because as, it's not just a revenue tax that uh, it's actually a problem. It's about imports. It's about importing uh, resources, even yeah. books. Um, there was a time that um, technology books were, right. had, had a good tax um, um, incentive or, or break exemption. Mm -hmm. But for some weird reason, in the past couple of years, about 10 years ago, I think, they removed that and suddenly it became expensive to import uh, technical books. Yeah. So it, it, it's both, well, both sides. Or even like simple things like Arduino, right? Or yes. Yeah. In Brazil, I mean, we pay like um, five times Arduino price per time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we have a bit of same. I mean, it's a bit schizophrenic. So on one hand, yes, they've subsidized import tax but there's a tax on books, all books. Mm -hmm. So even students are being taxed. You can't actually, it's really expensive to print books in Kenya. And also for the first five years from 2010, there's a subsidy on mo like uh, mobile phones, uh, VAT value added tax. That was reintroduced. So on one hand, it's like taking with one hand and then giving with another. And so it, it's exactly what Jay was saying. It's all monolithic and very complex. When you look at it end to end, sometimes it doesn't make sense. So there's a big need, I think, for governments to sit down with innovators in technology and in other spaces and actually talk through these tax regimes and just show them how it just doesn't work out for anybody. Yeah, and it's funny because maybe um, there's something about being grassroots and small, because this, this picture that I put in my presentation there, you know the ducks? Can you oh, see the ducks? Yeah. Yeah, this, this was made by like uh, big industrials in Brazil because they want less taxes for them, but like they already have a lot of less tax, right? Because like automo auto, like automobile industries, they like pay almost nothing. So it's nice that we, like, Governments is investing in the big ones, and they mm. still want more. Mm. But like the small ones, uh, the one that really have uh, less uh, organization to advocate and put ducks. This is the parliament, right? Right. So they put a lot of ducks, and they were like uh, calling attention to who pays for the duck, because it's the same in Brazil, quem paga o pato, and they they are saying that they are paying the duck of Brazil. So <laughs> you know, music. Yes, hello, uh, I'm Martin from Colombia. I run Apiario, a network of local innovation hubs in, in my country. So um, maybe in, in the electronics importation in Colombia, exciting things are happening. Um, I will talk 
in later about a world a digital ecosystem that we are building in Colombia. But uh, in terms of importing electronics, we have a policy that uh, all electronics under around 400 euros have tax ex exemption. Uh, this is a part of a good policy uh, to generate appropriation for the, for the masses, for the base. And basically, to import electronics in Colombia, now you, we have the cheapest electronics in Latin America. Really? So it's, it's, it's cheaper to buy in Colombia than go to the United States and buy. You know? So that's so good. Um, yeah. Second semester here at home. Okay, so next point, something that's quite general actually. Wait, it's not working. Okay, go. Red tape, bureaucracy. So this is really something that we get to do in a daily basis. Uh, a lot of people in the survey answered like this is the main problem. They think it's the main problem because uh, all the other problems really, I mean, come through it because you, you spend more money and you, we, we had some answers about people that took one year to open a company. And then for startup, in one year, you're dead already for like eight months. But we also had some people like really one answering it took one or two days. So you do have some uh, nice examples throughout the world, but usually, I don't know, who wants to start? Do you want to talk, uh, Jay? Or? Okay. Um, well, yeah, it's a, it's a universal problem, really, but in varying degrees. Yeah. Okay. Um, starting a corporation or a company, back home will normally take you officially about three days to seven days. Um, but in reality, it'll take you almost a month um, just to get all those permits done. You know, it, it's the incorporation to start with, be a tax registration, um, municipal permits, etc. There's so many. All the way to um, fire, fire permits, right. inspection, and all that. And... Um, you know, it's crazy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely a big problem back home. People are trying to f find so ways to solve it. They acknowledge it, the government. They acknowledge it, definitely. Um, but again, you know, top, top down policy making doesn't necessarily translate to the execution on the ground right. level. Right. Um, so that's a big challenge. Yeah. The um, other um, scenario would be being a startup. Okay, being in the world of startups, um, you'd want to have the opportunity to close down a startup if it fails very fast. Mm -hmm. okay, but it, you know, trying to, trying to uh, um, go through the solution of a company is very tedious and very tough. Um, and and um, most people, you know, lawyers actually, uh, advise us to just abandon it. <laughs> Just leave it there, you know, X amount of years, it'll just expire, etc. Um, but yeah, those are things that, uh, that again, policy has to, has to address. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that's, that's uh, um, the same with the, uh, other countries. Yeah. Um, you, know, the, you know, all these things, tax and, and red tape, it's only forcing, let's say, innovators to go to other countries and incorporate there mm -hmm. because it's easier. Um, it's easier to incorporate in Singapore, maybe in Delaware, in the United States. Mauritius, and then, you know, so yeah. the government's just shooting and themselves in the, the foot. The session yesterday about brain drain. Yeah. Also yeah. That's so, and then, um, yeah. you know, the, the government's just making it more difficult for them. The end result is really negative for them because yeah. they're, the hackers will find a way to, 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 the, yeah, to the system. Yeah, I mean, and bureaucracy is expensive, hey? Because at every level, you're either also going to be... It's expensive for the government. Yeah. No, it's also expensive to you because you're either going to be bribing somebody or spending, it's an opportunity cost to the time you're going to be lining up. Um, in Kenya, for instance, now they're introducing a cost for registering companies of a certain nominal value. Now, in the scale of it, if you're a small or medium enterprise, you're being charged more than if you're a bigger company. So it's a regime that really just favors bigger companies than smaller ones. And you're absolutely right. What's the incentive then to get into the system from the get-go? So it's just an expensive thing for everybody. And it's a lose-lose. Yeah, it's yeah. a lose-lose. Yeah. But they see it as a win, maybe throw something in the, or some mud on the wall, hopefully it will stick type of situation. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think in Colombia it's, it's not different. The, the bureaucracy is, is high. Um, open a company is, is not difficult. Uh, you can open a company in two days, basically <laughs> one day to put the papers, another day to get an account in your bank. Um, close the company is not easy. So open is easy, close the company is not <laughs> easy. Uh, but um, I think it's, it's similar. Uh, we need to uh, um, accelerate the, all, all that processes and and, 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 but yes, uh, opening a company in Colombia is, is not uh, difficult. To Montaigne. To Montaigne? Wow. It's another topic. Flexibility. So, a lot of people in that survey answered about there's no legal structure for me because I want to be a social innovator or uh, my business model is different and uh, I don't even know what my business model is, and uh, so what should I do? I'm not a company, and I'm not a big enterprise, so there's no legal framework for me. So we see that the government are really uh, being slow in answering to these new models that are emerging. And then, um, so this is what's really like, almost 100% of people through all the countries that answered our survey really told us that, uh, yeah, you, then you have to be, for example, you want to be a non-profit, but you want, don't want to be an NGO, so, but you end up like building, buying uh, your own company so you can have profit and then invest in your non-profit. So it gets uh, really complex. So I don't know, want to start? Martin? Yeah, I think that, that's a very, very good point. Um, because, uh, I, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm part of a, uh, a business that uh, we, we say is um, social business, okay? Uh, the social businesses are businesses that are uh, so focused to generate impact, to generate uh, transformation, and to generate profit, and to generate uh, sustainability. But we don't have, in general, I think, in the, in the world, um, uh, a model for a, for a social business. Uh, or you are a company, or you are an NGO, okay? Uh, but uh, it's not bad to transform the world and to uh, earn money with that, okay? So um, I think uh, we need to work more in, on that flexibility, and not only in terms of the legal um, uh, framework, but in terms of the resources that you use to, um, to do you, your job. For example, if we like to create an SMS service that will send you an SMS to save a life, the telecommunications taxes for that SMS is so high. So you need to pay a lot of taxes to send an SMS that will save a life. Or if, or if you like to, to generate, and to know, a voice portal or some kind of uh, services that will change lives or, or will educate people, so I think that we need to create to uh, maybe a more flexibility in terms of the legality for the social businesses and the access to the services that we use to create the impact and the work that we do. I'll give a, um, a, a real example of that, that particular scenario that you're talking about. Um, I think about two, two years ago, um, in, during Typhoon Haiyan, which uh, um, was really bad, there were some, some, um, some guys that wanted to set up a mapping, mapping uh, and, and um, disaster location mapping type of thing. And then they relied on an SMS service to send uh, that, that uh, data to a server and then proper mapping. The problem was not with the government because uh, the government was too busy all right, <laughs> trying to right. bring in all these... Um, 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 relief, and, yeah, relief goods, yeah. etc. The the barrier was big, the big telco, yeah. because we are in a, sort of like a duopoly back home, and we needed to accommodate both services, right? Both both uh, brands of telco. One telco, which is the bigger one, blocked the the SMS because it was not um, within the terms of use. Yeah. So, you know, it's not just government that, that can give you a problem, but it can be big yeah. companies as well. And the way I see it is um, the status quo with this flexibility issue and with many issues as far as bureaucracies and inefficiencies go, there are beneficiaries. And with this particular issue, you find that in that situation, you even have telcos then who want to ring down, they really want to clamp down on innovators so that you're working under their terms and conditions. So 
what you find is a case of whether they'll strong arm you and take your idea because they, you need to use their service. And so there's a lot of arm twisting that then has to happen because you're relying on their service and they want to look good. They want to be the ones who look good. So you're caught in a situation where you want to do good but you're at the mercy of either a telco or another bigger company because this rigidity is something they are able to lobby for. So you find, for instance, they will be able to lobby for, I guess, tax relief if they set up foundations. Then in those foundations, they'll say, for, especially for those who are tech companies, mm -hmm. they will say that they're going to support innovators. But what that essentially means, and people who are from the East African region will know, we've seen this before, is that means when they set up funds or competitions or whatnot, they're really just trying to get people at their mercy. They're trying to own the IP. The moment mm. you sign up for a competition, they'll tell you they own the IP. So it's really a structure that is... They're not trying to advocate is for not, you, right? It's not. The hackathon. It's crazy. I mean, it's actually ridiculous because it's their beneficiaries, and that, that one is going to be a tricky one. And I'm super interested in finding out if there are any other countries that are starting to sort of hack that, mm. right? Because it's, the status quo also is benefiting some people. So... Does anybody have one nice story to share about that? Come, 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 come. come. Yeah, it, it's turning into a. What's your, please tell me what's your name session. and where you're from. Oh, yeah. So, my name is Paul Mushane. I'm from uh, Kenya. I also work with Nanjira. And I just wanted to add a very good example to what she had mentioned. In Kenya, we, last year there was a very interesting case between a Bitcoin startup and the existing telco. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the issue here. The existing telco had a product which is called mobile money that is called M-Pesa that allows you to buy and sell using your mobile phone and uh, also, also do other kinds of transactions. But at the same time, uh, the Bitcoin uh, startup also wanted to allow people to transact using a mobile phone and they were running on this existing telco's infrastructure. So what really happened is that bizarrely the telco went to the central bank and actually told the central bank to not shut down the Bitcoin startup but to warn people about Bitcoin and to give Bitcoin maybe sort of a bad name, let's call it a condescending name that it is used in child, uh, you know, in it's used in uh, child pornography, it's used by criminals, it's all that. So basically that's what the central bank did. And uh, this is actually a very, very good example of whereby an existing incumbent that has its own platform is trying to stop another startup from doing so and it'll go to great lengths even to talk to the government to actually help them do that. Next one? No. So next one is... I don't even remember. Let's see. That's the one that's relieved. Like Incentives. Yes. So, <laughs> um, a lot of people in the survey answer about rent subsidies because a lot of the people in the network of gig are hub managers. And uh, the bad part of being a hub manager is about, I mean, first years of paying rent. And then we've seen that it works, and that there are countries that actually have uh, rent subsidies. There was just all this research about the China makerspace and uh, how the government is actually uh, subsidizing some rents for uh, makerspaces in China. And uh, so this is something that a lot of people said, but not only, I mean, I think rent subsidies is only one uh, way of incentive, like they can have grants or you can have a direct investment. So I think it depends on the case. So I think we have some good examples also to share now about incentives. Yeah, yeah. Nanjira, you start. <laughs> I don't know if I have good, good examples. Yeah. Nobody but. can. But you can start with better examples. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, on this one, it's it's also very interesting because that predi it's predicated on government incentives being that government has a, an okay-ish relationship with non-government entities. So, of course, one of the big things is people feel like it would be great if rent was subsidized, and I actually agree on that completely, because if you're a small hub and you're trying to just rent some space, a warehouse or this, that, or the other, you're going to have to pay the same market rate regardless. But um, what I've found, again, is that the incentives that we see with the current government structures, again, benefit the bigger companies. And in our case, for instance, they benefit uh, foreign companies. So you have... Um, and I, 
IBM, for instance, will get better incentives, for instance, to have space than they would you, a small startup, because A, you're, what the hell are you? The traditional relationship between government and non-government entities. So that political connotation is tricky. On the flip side, I imagine a situation where, say, iHub or any other hub got government incentive by way of rent subsidies or grants. Then the perception is government owns your ASS. So. Uh, I don't know if we can say those words. Um, yeah, so it's a tricky one, this one, and um, I think this is one of those cases where I think in Singapore, in China, it's worked out okay, but I'm not very sure about where I fall around what direct linkage government has to these entities. Um, so I think for me, it's more of questions and rhetoric than a, an example. Yet. I think the, it's clear that um, you know, a lot of the, um, the plans or, or incentives that governments establish are a result of a disconnect with uh, the actual beneficiaries of such incentives. Mm. Um, we're not to just talking about incentives, I mean, the bureaucracy, the tax, everything that we spoke about. There's really a huge disconnect because you've got people in the government that assume based on maybe an academic it's study. It's academic. Oh, is yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that's a, a good intro. But yeah, it's it's a. But you have. Yeah. Okay. An exa example. A good example is um, Singapore. Okay. Um, the government is very active in spurring innovation because of just because they have so much money in Singapore, and then there's got so many. There you have so many pro programs that are available to entrepreneurs, but then in the early days, because it's a mandated grant they rush to accept projects or ideas mm -hmm. or businesses. And then the quality of these, these uh, businesses are, are very questionable. And then, you know, we, around that it's time. Like it could be good, but it's not. Yes. Yeah. And um, so the result was, at least at that time, was a grand entrepreneur phenomenon. Okay, you've got people <laughs> joining a competition, pitch competition, etc. Yeah. You're taking the cash. Just for the grant, not for the interview. Failing yeah. and then yeah. trying to create some, some, some other idea and then joining again, etc. But I guess according to... Is it better to, now? Do you, do you know? Yeah, I, I, I heard that. No, it's still the same. It's getting worse. It's getting, it's getting worse. worse. Okay, okay. So it's a case uh, of monitoring and evaluation are not working in this case. Yeah, so no, in the, that case, unfortunately, it's called that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's called compreneurship. Yeah. Competition preneurship. Yes. So. Unfortunately, yeah. Singapore and Southeast Asia is a model to follow. Okay. So if you, you're actually creating a, a, a bad uh, model. example of policy, but everybody else thinks it's a good example, people will copy it and then you've just exponentially created a big, huge problem. Okay. Maybe in terms of incentives, um, uh, let me uh, explain you a little bit about the digital ecosystem that uh, Colombia is building. Basically, the digital ecosystem has uh, four parts. The first one is the infrastructure. So Colombia is investing a lot to uh, give broadband and to give connectivity to the entire country. That infrastructure generates services. That services as voice, SMS, data, um, geolocation services, different kind of services that is, are the offer. The offer bring to the demand uh, and for entrepreneurs the possibility to uh, start to create apps. Apps for people, okay? Apps are the third component and the people are the fourth component. With more apps created, more people will be using that apps that will uh, grow the infrastructure. With more infrastructure, more service that will generate uh, innovative uh, apps that will uh, attend more people. So basically, uh, we are now in the moment to generate appropriation. And one good incentive that uh, the government is creating is call it apps.co, if you see in internet, apps.co is the, is the policy that basically are motivating entrepreneurs to be social entrepreneurs, so basically to create applications for education, for agriculture, for health, and for the main vocations that our country, uh, that my country have. So that is very interesting because that is very connected with a science, technology, and innovation policy that uh, is no more focused, not in uh, research uh, about the moon, about nanotechnology, that's in fact very, very good uh, researchers, 
resources, but to invest uh, and to research about agriculture, about food, about energy, and about our main vocations. And the social entrepreneurs and the uh, digital content entrepreneurs are now in, on that digital ecosystem and through apps.co initiative, a thousand of entrepreneurs are now uh, starting to create um, apps for the base of the pyramid. Does anybody want to share something about that? You want to share? Yeah, but you have to come here if you want to share. Please. I like, I like this point. Mike? I like this point of Marty. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, I grow older and I get more anarcho-capitalist ear. So, okay, if you have uh, great taxes and you have uh, a big amount of bureaucracy and you have a lot of problems, Obviously, you convert it in your price, and you and you will you sell products more expensive for that. And so it's like if I pay more taxes, it means that I'm earning more money. And okay, I think the focus on the conversation is not the problems that have for this. That is the same almost around the world, but it's the difference that the treatment for the big companies and the small companies that is around, and how this can be can be treated, how this can be moved, and how can we push forward more initiatives of low bottom entrepreneurship. So, uh, because the problems for what I see is the same all around. Yeah. And it's not, if, if Martin sells a lot, he will pay a lot of taxes. But that's not the point. The point is the duck, just like I said in the beginning. Yeah. So Thanks. This is the thing. Uh -huh. So, top down approach. So, these guys, I don't know who they are, but probably they're making some really nice rules about us. And uh, usually, what happens is just stay like in a room and the door is closed. So, the thing is, how can we foster <laughs> bottom up approach, right? So, uh, this is a challenge. Of course, I'm making fun. I mean, it's not easy for the government to actually reach out uh, for the grassroots, but I think, I mean, we think that. They should, and it's their obligation, right? So how can we call their attention more, and how can we participate or co-design policies that actually reflect our universe? You know, how can we reach out? Because usually what you see is well-intentioned, like really well-intentioned policies that doesn't work, or that just sometimes uh, are even worse. They, they, they screw up the ecosystem, for example, by competing. For example, we have some policies that are building in, in Brazil which, I mean, from one part, point of view is nice. They are building their own public fab labs, which are nice, but at the same point, like the, the other fab labs that were already there from civil society, bottom up, they have no incentives, so they're probably gonna die because then people don't wanna pay for, for use if they have a public one, right? So how can government actually work together with society, not against it? So I don't know if we have um, any nice examples of our, about bottom-up policy, but I think maybe Jay has something that they have been trying to do at least, yeah. right? Together with uh, the uh, Yeah, there's local. one senator that we have. He's quite young, which is the young? perfect example yeah. for a champion in the government. Yeah. Um, because he understands it, or at least he's very interested in it. So um, we, through him, um, we were trying to put together a startup bill. There was a startup roadmap that we actually put together, but again, you know, I'm not a big fan of all these uh, paper um, uh, roadmaps that you present to government, because <laughs> as soon as you put it on paper, it's obsolete. The road disappears. Okay, it doesn't, it's not as flexible as, as you want it to be. Right. It's already, you know. It's, mm. Now, um, but again, this person, uh, one of our senators, is trying to push a startup bill as a result of coordination with stakeholders in the, in the community. Um, and I think that's, the, that's a good approach. That's really the approach to do. Um, but again, he's only one person. He's only one senator. We're trying to look for champions within the government bureaucracy. Yeah. And I know there are, because there's some people that have just, just suddenly implemented a open gov, open data uh, uh, initiative, and it, mm -hmm. and it just happened. Um, so, um, that's definitely one approach. As we were having our pre-panel uh, briefing yesterday, um, I had some weird ideas about trying to reach out to the senator. Hey, why don't you spend like uh, two days with me and just shadow me and, and see exactly what, right. what we go through in an entrepreneurial world. Yeah. Um, they really have to, to, to yeah. experience yeah. it, 
learn the jargon, learn the language. Yeah, we have to have some strategies, right? It's a, yeah. yeah, this is this is one of those issues that um, would, if we ever fix it, I think the world will be a better place. But that's going to take a while. Now, on top of that. This speaks to the fact that we can't also just think that our role is to disrupt and it ends there. One of the things I've appreciated working in a hub for the last four years is that this is a very political issue. So you have to know these politicians, you have to engage. Exactly. Now, a problem I must say on our end is sometimes we take the stance that, you know, our work is to disrupt, F the government, anarchy, yeah? yeah. But unfortunately, but no. the, as, as, as long as the world is how it is, yeah. you do have mm. to engage. So this, for me, what I've learned is, this is why we set up iHub Research, for instance, at iHub at the time. And this is why not only did we do research, but we started finding entry points for policy engagement. Because there aren't bodies, at least I don't know if you have any in other countries, bodies that exist to lobby the government for our interests. So we have them for private sector, and even for private sector, those that exist for technology are for the big companies. So it's the telcos and their friends. So there's a need for that, and that means time, and that means you have to have people on your team. That means you have to get these people who are policy makers to hang out at the hubs. Mm -hmm. They have to hang out at the hubs. Yeah. And I think for me, the value proposition for something like Global Innovation Gathering is also to engage uh, the bodies, regional and international bodies that we know our governments listen to. Okay. So when the World Bank makes a recommendation, damn straight, they better be making a recommendation based on what we've influenced them to be. So me, this is a roundabout thing that needs a multi-pronged and very mm -hmm. strategic approach. And it actually also, unfortunately, means an attitude adjustment on our yeah. side that we can't. And so please don't see me and think that because I've ditched the genes for the more suited up thing that I've betrayed the cause. Yeah. It's really because we have to do this. Yeah. Somebody has to do this. We can't just be shouting on one end and government can't be over there doing their thing on the other end and nobody's doing the in-between. So this one, we all need to reconfigure a little bit. My question is, um, what, is there really um, um, synergy <coughs> in, in terms of pace between both worlds? Mm. Because innovation inherently is changing, it's disrupting, it's rapid. Is there an ideal situation where we can have the government move us fast? Is that an, an, uh, something that's possible? Yeah, of course it is, Jay. I'm really optimistic. You know? Okay. You have to All believe. Right. And it's All something right. that you don't really have a choice, right? This is why actually why we are doing also this, talk, this session and why we made the survey. Yeah. It's because uh, all the time we meet, we always complain about the government. So I started my, my ses the session today speaking that we we're going to say like therapy group, but it's not the case. I was just kidding. I mean, of course, I think we, we, have, we have to get, get our hands dirty a bit, like actually shake hands. And, uh, you know, some of us need you know, because otherwise we're just going to be like in separate sides yeah. and like uh, with a wall. And yeah. I have a good um, anecdote though um, to share. Um, um, you're familiar with Grab Taxi. That's very, that's very uh, popular in Southeast Asia. It's a taxi hailing up. It's like Easy Taxi in my ta uh, Easy mm -hmm. Taxi here. Um, and then Uber. Okay. Apparently, Grab Taxi's approach as they enter a market is that they engage government already at the start um, to, to make sure that policies, you know, they, they try to, they try to um, educate the government, right. uh, make sure that their, their, their policies are all um, in place, their, their activities are within those policies. So that's their strategy. They've taken that already. Uber has never taken that. They always do a reactive approach. You know, they, they come in, you know, the typical disruptor, Approach. You it come won't. in, start your business, and then the government pushes back. They're not able to, yeah. yeah so it's reactive. Grab did that. Stripe is doing that. Um, they they took a page out of the strategy of Grab Taxi. Stripe, the payment gateway. Um, as they enter into markets, they make sure that they they engage the government. Right. So that's a positive thing, actually. Yeah. That's a very good point about um, how to educate our governors and our policy makers about um, this post-industrial revolution. I think that uh, the most important thing that, that is happening with a lot of this boom of innovation spaces, hacker spaces, maker spaces, on all uh, those that, uh, innovations is uh, that are bottom-up uh, innovations. They are, uh, in terms of policy, uh, that spaces are creating 
micro policies. Micro policies because no one know better about the territory than these spaces. So uh, I think that uh, connect the policy makers with the base and enable uh, a way to promote the creation of innovations from the bottom is, is, is so, so interesting. Um, uh, good uh, appropriation steps uh, are happening in Colombia. For example, we have now 800 uh, new spaces around uh, Colombia, are appropriation spaces in different levels. Uh, but now we need to make that spaces more sustainable, uh, to put uh, methodologies, to put contents, and to connect that spaces with the main vocations. Uh, maybe not only create innovations for everything, but to connect the innovation with the direct territory. If your context is fishing, for sure that innovation in space should generate innovation for fishing. If your context is agriculture, you could generate innovation for agriculture. So generate a narrative, generate a storytelling for the innovation. Not, it's not only technology. It's a question to connect the contents and to create histories that could transform the territories from the bottom to the top. I actually want to ask a question. How many policy people are left in the room? How many policy people are left in the room? Policy, policy people. People, one. people who work one. with governments or... Who work for are... the government here? Only two? Neither? We thank you for still hanging out with thank us, Katine. Thank you for staying. I mean, this speaks... Please share. My point, Georgia, my point to this is really... Um, yeah, it's part of the problem is that this conversation amongst us here, we're preaching to the choir. Right? Um, the few that I knew walked out, so I don't know if we bored them or we spoke a revolutionary term, but it's... So, no, my point being, um, it's super important to figure out what spaces can we bring this policy people... Yeah, just join us already. Stop pretending, just join us. <laughs> so, part of the top-down approach is the fact that which spaces then can they come and listen to us? Which, one? Which spaces then can policymakers and advisors to governments come and listen to us, right? Because in this room, again, if we're preaching yeah, yeah, to the choir... Yeah, but there's something about, like, this session. We, we were supposed to have also someone from ITU, for example, because I thought we were, like, we were thinking about the session also. Uh, I mean, I think we also we, we can, we have to call them also, you know? And, then, and sometimes really go there and take them by the hand. Like, please come. Like... Uh, and it's not easy, I understand what you're saying, but um, <coughs> so I think, it's, yeah. uh, I think it starts from there, right? They, they, to have more the, of them. I think Geek does a, a lot of this, like by bringing like, down the, the Gulf people around, yeah. at least to see, right? Doesn't mean that something is going on, for, but at least they see. A change will come. You really want to <laughs> share something? Yeah, it's, uh, Can you give it's me a mix. Uh, and, all right. Uh, it's very important, the point th that Martin showed here, is that uh, we are not in doing, we, us, them, we are not in doing something that is really, oh, it's so grassroots and we are fighting against something. It's valuable. If you know that your territory, this is quite valuable for this, this yeah. that we saw behind us. So, it's, and who, who is a policy making here? I am. Nice. It, it does, uh, we are. It doesn't matter <coughs> if you are walking into a state government approach or outside of it. We are always doing. So if you show the big leaders that it's quite valuable, you are starting to make policies as well with the value that you have in your hands. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm David. I'm uh, from Switzerland and I'm uh, blogging for a... Uh, the Swiss Startup Association, so that's a lobby organization, which um, is really new. And um, we try also to um, connect startups with um, politicians and with the policy makers, um, because we understood um, that's really important. And um, that's the only way we can uh, have a voice for startups. So now we are, we have a lot of <coughs> members, like the main uh, Swiss startups are already members and it's really okay Switzerland is a tax paradise for big enterprises but not for startups ah. so the problem is <laughs> startups they get when they they um, the future value of the startup is already taxed for the entrepreneurs so that means people have to leave the country because they can't afford these taxes 
So now they changed a little bit, but it's still a, a big problem. And another thing is like <clears throat> people from not EU countries cannot um, come as workers into the country because it's too complicated to make a contract um, with them. And yeah, in my opinion, that's the only way that um, you can have a voice. So startups have Being to together. be together and try to, to um, meet the politicians and make them understand even what the startup is. Because the problem is um, startups, the value of a startup is so into the, it's so, the, the value is in the future, you know, like, and, but it's not easy to get politicians because they are also representing um, small and middle enterprises. And when people or when the government starts to change the tax system, then other enterprises came as well and say, yeah, we are also want to have other tax um, conditions, and then it gets really complicated. But um, yeah, what I want to say is you really have to, to go together and, and have a voice together. Um, that's the only way. And it's, I think every country should have um, kind of a <clears throat> startup association, which um, we have now in Switzerland, um, to have a voice. And then the stronger and the bigger it gets, then politicians understand, okay, these startups, um, they, they do, they, um, that's the, they organize. yeah, they organize, they, they, they have, they um, have, play, like they, they do work, they, they do work for <laughs> the future of, of our country. And that's, then you, you got them and you are talking about this, um, startups, uh, look, last year startups had, um, they, they will like 500 new um, um, uh, let's say, uh, employment. employments, thanks. Um, and then you, 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 can, you can bring the politicians on your side and then they start to bring re um, better regulations, but that's the only way. So just work together in every country and, and have a voice. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and that's, it's, it's, rem it's wonderful in notion, but one of the things we also have to be honest about is to be very careful to also not be uh, in competition because then the problem with that is becomes who's the superstar who gets the glory. And I think for context, what humbles me is we're going to be those people in 10 mm -hmm. onwards years. Will we make it easier for the next generations? Um, because it's easy now to be on the other side and just say, ah, yeah, yeah, this is that and the other. But even as we are doing these things, we have to, I don't know, what, there's a very conscious decision we have to make that in this, then we don't get caught up in trying to... Ego. Ego, ego trips, you know, like yeah. just now it's about me, I'm the superstar, I'm the representative, I'm blocking other voices. There are these things that we have to be awakened to so that as much as we're marching forward, we're not making, we're not just restricting the doors, but actually making it easier for... Yeah others in the future. Anybody else want to? Uh, yeah. Do you want to sit? <laughs> you have a time. Thank you. So a little bit different approach, uh, but uh, there are uh, some uh, there are some solutions to the problems you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, especially to problems. Can with you present yourself first? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Paweł from Poland, uh, but I'm also Estonian e resident, uh, and I think that this is something we can talk about uh, because Estonia is actually trying to create uh, a country to country services, mm. some kind of proxy for uh, countries which aren't ready to host startups, to host small companies. Uh, even maker spaces, and uh, Estonia isn't trying to become a tax haven. Uh, instead, they are allowing people from around the world, not connected to Estonia in any way, mm. to set up a virtual company, a totally digital, uh, a bank account, a phone number in Estonia that allows them to access uh, European Union uh, with, uh, with uh, all those uh, things, and basically, 
it serves as a proxy because the money you raise as a company or FabLab or uh, whatever your organization is, uh, isn't uh, taxed by Estonian government unless you actually spend money in Estonia. So you can basically use it as a proxy without uh, worrying about all the laws in your local country. So you have to do this tax form, this tax form, this tax form. You only just uh, start paying to your employees or to yourself as your employee in any country in the world. And then uh, Estonia does most of the work for you, just uh, supplying the tax forms, etc. So this might be actually a good idea for uh, small businesses around the world. Uh, and uh, I think in about half a year, the program will come to a full start because right now the Estonian banks aren't cooperating that good <laughs> as well. Uh, nevertheless, I think we should just uh, remember that this is an option. Right. Yeah, that's my point right. uh, yeah. earlier, um, yeah. that there are ways yeah. to make the government problems irrelevant yeah. for an uh, for, um, you know, industrious person. Um, oh, yeah. But again, I mean, is that what we want to do? Or is that where the direction that we're really going towards? Yeah. This is let's do that. We are in the last minute, so does anybody have a question? Uh, one last one. Can then Geraldine wants to read something? A blog post? Question? <coughs> you want to come here? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to sit here because I'm British and scared. Okay. Um, uh, I want to kind of defend government in some way because the, we may not have very many policy makers here. But yesterday at the makerspace, the incredible thing that Gig and Republica have been able to do, that you know, we, we've had representatives of the chairperson of the, um, aid, the German government aid donor, the, pe the person who oversees the policy of the way that German aid gets distributed. We've had a very large number of people from GTZ, the company that works with the um, aid ministry, to try and figure out how they need to change in order to be able to support this movement more. I think one of the things, I mean, one of the things I've found actually is that, um, you know, whether it's governments, the government in Kenya or the government in Nepal, or even the government in my country, the UK, they, they, they have been supporting us um, in the maker movement to try and find ways to support their healthcare systems and, and their supply chain issues and actually their needs to try and spend aid money. I mean, my, my, my government's desperately trying to find ways to spend its increasing aid budget. And, it's, and so it keeps coming to us saying, would you mind going to this, that, and the other meeting? So I think, I think there's some opportunities there. I wanted to try and defend that. The, hard, the thing that the government really finds hard is what's written behind you, is that, that I, I, I think they're not quite sure where to put maker spaces or hack spaces or fab labs or this the global innovation gathering movement because it transcends the traditional organization of government yeah. so it, it it does water stuff it does healthcare stuff it does entrepreneurship stuff it does education stuff where does it fit and i think that's 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 really the the policy trying to figure out where so we, we fit th in the policy you think we should help them important. right yeah help them understand yeah absolutely yeah. Uh, it's, I'm sitting here. Uh, oh. It's like, okay, so prepare a, a lobby, a lobby group or whatever to go to govern, but then to go with govern with the, the, the language that they understand. So what is, what's the incoming, what is the budget, what's the wealth, how, what's the changing economy? So if we go there and start a dialogue to see, look, we are doing so well to this, uh, reflecting economy in this way, in this, that way, in the society, that way. So I think it's, it's an interface problem that we have. I, I, I really don't think government are bad, even though they are, but uh, I don't believe the population are bad, even though they are. Mm. So it's this problem of interface that we are facing now that we have to go further and have to, 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 to have this interface to talk with the government. Can I have Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 
think that's so true what you said, Ricardo, and um, I totally also agree with what you said, Andrew. I, from my side, I'm really happy to keep having this conversation, yeah, exactly. however long it takes. I yeah. think we all, from our side, are always open to introduce, yeah. to translate, to share. I think the question that one has to ask themselves, though, is that sometimes these, the two systems, big governmental systems, and the way that we operate, they, they clash. They clash in culture, they clash in operations. And the question we have to ask ourselves, at what point do we, as you said earlier, Jay, just do our thing and not bend over backward to accommodate for the other system? That's a hard balancing act, difficult question, but a question that we need to keep asking ourselves, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we have to finish. Um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, as Geraldine said, this is, on, this is an ongoing conversation that we have to keep having and uh, go further with it. Maybe some uh, create some uh, practices, good practices that ha that you know that that uh, that are working around the world. You know, maybe together in a, I don't know. Let's, we have to think more about it. But I think uh, it's only a start. The survey has some nice things as well that I think we have to. Keep going. So please, um, if you want to like keep doing this conversation as well, um, look for us here now, and we can, you know, exchange emails. And I think that really, uh, our friend from Switzerland said. I mean, we think we have to unite ourselves, you know, and uh, exchange uh, nice ideas. And before we finish, I just wanted to ask Geraldine to to uh, to read a blog post from our friend Tarek. Right. So yeah. I wanted to come up on stage and. Uh, the last hour has gone by so quickly. I think we could keep uh, talking for hours, and we will, like you said. Yeah. This is an open invitation to join this discussion and the research and the work we're doing and, and collaborate on this to all of you, whether you're in this room or, or watching later via video. I wanted to take up the last couple of minutes in this panel to raise one other issue and to talk about a friend who's missing here on stage right now. Um, we organize these international gatherings in different corners of the world, but sometimes or annually here in Germany, and a reoccurring issue that we always have is visas. Yeah. So being able to travel um, and being able to meet, being able to work together and collaborate is only possible if you have entry to somebody else's country. This is an issue within individual continents, and this is an issue globally, and it's an issue that we're faced with very, very often. Um, I want to name one other case. Um, there's a friend also missing from Tanzania, had a really hard time with the embassy to prove that he is a horrible German compound noun um, that I'm probably not going to get right now, but his um, Heimatswiederkehrverpflichtung something. Um, basically because he's self-employed and he's his own right. boss. What is he going to show for paper? It's not common that everybody has a bank account in Tanzania and neither does he. So it was very, very difficult for him to give proof that he was willing to return to his country. A huge problem for young innovators uh, who want to travel and share their story and work together with others. Um, but this, um, yeah, I, we were going to Skype somebody into the session who were dearly missing at Republica, and that is the founder of the Cairo Hacker Space, Cairo, um, Tarek, and his co-founders, the Safford Brothers. And sadly, they cannot be here with us today. Um, Tarek would be at least here via Skype right now, but not even that is possible because we were on the phone a couple of minutes ago, and he is now on his way to the German embassy who did not only not issue his visa in time, um, this could be a really elaborate story uh, about how embassies operate, in this case with a Vodafone-operated hotline, which you have to pay money to phone in to get an appointment. Um, after being given an appointment that was too late, like three months down the line, we managed to get him an early appointment, an appointment where that would have allowed him to get his passport and be here on time. But then in the meantime, his passport has been lost. And so he is now on the way to the embassy to find out what happened there after neither the private courier service that this embassy also uses to transfer passports, nor the embassy themselves know where it is. And that's why, sadly, it's not Tarek speaking directly to you now, but myself. Um, this is particularly tragic because some of us, as we've heard today, work under difficult circumstances. And some of us work under really, really difficult circumstances. And that is the case of the Cairo hacker space. Um, Tyra just sent me the link of a blog post they just published. And I would like to share a couple of paragraphs from that with you to close off the session. Um, so um, they do a lot of amazing work. And feel free to approach us at the Makerspace later if you want to find out more about it. But um, 
Yeah, I'm going to read and I'm going to summarize bits of this. You can ask me for the link later. So in November 2015, the Cairo Hackerspace was working on an ambitious project to build a mobile makerspace that would allow them to visit schools around Egypt. The idea was to spread making and hacking to kids who benefit from learning to use their hands and minds to solve problems creatively at a very early age. The larger goal of this project was to address the need for better alternative technical and technological education in the country. However, on um, the 28th of December, the space was shut down after a government interagency raid of the host, the Townhouse Gallery. The motivations for this raid have never been fully clarified, but ultimately resulted in the indefinite sealing of all townhouse property, including the studio hosting the Cairo Hacker Space. They began to receive a great deal of support for this injustice, uh, including generous financial offers, but could not accept any of those because of the legal restrictions on foreign funding in Egypt. After about two months in February, the townhouse partially reopened under very strict conditions, um, had to comply with new procedures required by government. Townhouse staff was allowed to access the space, um, but programming did not resume. They were very thankful that they could at least access the space and get out some of the tools they wanted to really get for this mobile maker space project. So they at least were able to set up this bus that they had already acquired to work on this project. Um, so these plans were halted again by a very sudden and very dubious partial collapse of the building in the beginning of April, which I'm sure a lot of you gathered. Thankfully, nobody was hurt at the time, but most of the building was destroyed. And um, although the space did not completely collapse, it was issued the, other day, the next day that the government would come to demolish the rest of the building. A sudden demolition order was granted on April 9th to this historic townhouse building, which includes not only this uh, art gallery, the townhouse, and the hacker space, but also residential units and other businesses. Um, despite confrontations with the municipalities and disputes <coughs> with the tenants, um, the, uh, the, the building was demolished on the morning of April 11th. You can tell I'm getting really emotional about this. Um, so there's been crowdfunding initiatives, etc. But as you notice from this blog post, it's very difficult for people in Egypt to receive any foreign funding or any support that way. Um, yeah, in the midst of all this, uh, maybe you can play the video on the side. So I wanted to give you a visual impression of the amazing work they do. Tarek never lost hope. They equip this mobile maker space and want to drive off and teach kids from this mobile space out in different schools, in different localities, in different places, which I think is just absolutely amazing. And in this blog post, he specifically thanks everybody, local and, in, and international supporters, and promises to be doing the best that they can hacking the situation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm devastated that Tarek and his co-founders cannot be with us today. We hope to be able to fly them out later in the week for them to be at least able to join the gig program or for us to maybe host a workshop with them, some of the workshops that they couldn't give now at the Makerspace later in this week, if not at Republica in another venue somewhere. Um, we're collecting donations at the, um, at the Makerspace for the Cairo Hackerspace which people can um, take back to Egypt uh, personally. Um, please feel free to turn to me if you have any questions about this. Um, and yeah, hopefully Tarek will at least be able to watch this video. So let's give them all a really big round of applause for their fantastic work. Thank you, thank you. Have a good day, people.